Afghanistan's capital, Kabul, is not a destination for the nervous. In this war-ruined city, you take your pick of threats. Too many people carry weapons. I mean, number one, the game in investigative journalism is impact. So in this busy media environment, you can do a great story and it will, you know, almost like the, the tree falling in the, in the forest. Uh, so how do you have impact if you can partner with a, a credible, respected, in-depth television outlet like Four Corners or 60 Minutes, uh, suddenly your newspaper story has a, has a fresh life and a fresh audience. And if you can be smart about it and strategic about it, you, know, you drop the television program and then you've got three or four days of really powerful follow-ups, fresh news breaks, creating a momentum of its own, selling the story that everyone ignored on Sunday and tried to ignore on Monday by Tuesday. Now, oh, hang on, it's getting pretty hard to ignore and there's suddenly political buy-in. So you know, partnering up with other outlets, other media platforms, I think is absolutely critical nowadays. Working with other journalists, though, is also, it makes for better investigative journalism. The big mistake that investigative journalism or journalists sometimes have, I mean, the most obvious thing that we face is confirmation bias. <clears throat> Sitting by yourself, you have a theory, you're collecting your evidence, you're not really looking at evidence that doesn't support your theory. If you can have that colleague, and it's got to be, a, you need a colleague who you can have a, a friendly fight with, basically. So be Chris Masters or Richard Baker, and I'll say, Nick, pull your head in. I mean, you, you've, you're focusing a lot on that, but what about what's over there? And having that really ongoing tension in the evidence gathering process, that makes the journalism better. It makes the information you gather stronger. And that second set of eyes, there's also a second set of sources. Suddenly, you know, the minister hates my guts, but Richard Baker's been drinking with him for 10 years, so he can have a quiet chat. The good cop, bad cop. And media has traditionally been fairly competitive and worked in silos. So do you think we'll see more of these kind of collaborations in future? I think the whole silo mentality is or died the minute the internet became an integral part of journalism because... A story is only an exclusive now uh, for 30 seconds. It's, you know, in the old days of newspapers and no internet, okay, it made sense, you keep your story secure, you make sure no one steals it and you've got that front page. You've got the whole day, it's only you in the newspaper and no one else can get it till the next day when the, when the printing presses heat up again that, that evening. Nowadays, your story's online and people can you know, rip it, they can follow up very quickly, make the call, get a confirmation. So the idea of working in that silo to maintain your exclusive at all costs is ridiculous. Uh, you know, the smart thing to do is to think to yourself, well, who in my competitive uh, outlets, who, who normally doesn't like the age, to say a news limited paper, but who in there, which journalist in there is actually quite interested in this story? I'll give them a call before my story goes out. A few days before, I'll trust them and say, well, you may not follow, you may not be interested, but here's an angle you can pursue yourself and suddenly they're off and away pushing the issue that I think is important, uh, they think is important, and the journalism has got, has got you know, fresh legs. So working in partnerships, working with rival outlets where you can, being highly strategic about how you do your journalism to cut through all that noise in the modern media is absolutely crucial. Talking about noise in the media, I mean, you know, everything seems to be a lot quicker these days. You know, you get it, you publish it, and you move on to the next story. Yet investigative journalism does take time. It's one of the greatest assets. So is it a struggle to get time to do stories properly? Something we all in the media value and respect, something audiences really want. And as, you know, newspaper of revenue have, has declined, media companies are struggling they've seen the value in keeping investigative journalism not just alive but but financing it and, and, and as they've seen i think the success of big stories become defining moments in journalism um, the talk of the nation and really increasing the credibility of of our brands our mastheads i think our our bean counters have said well this is not a bad investment so while the media now is at a more perilous or in a more perilous position than it's been in in years for obvious reasons that Google's or Facebook's killing our digital advertising revenue, so on and so forth. I'm getting more time to do stories and more resourcing support than ever before. And it's it's terrific. But that said, you know, the money's not for free. I've got to I've got to deliver. And that's that hangs over my head 
like a big cloud. It, you know, it's the anxiety, the constant anxiety. The more time you've, you, you've got given, the more flights you've been given, the more money you've been given, the more defamation risks you, you take, um, the more you think, geez, I've got to deliver and I can't stuff up. So the pressure's on to produce, right? It's probably the biggest struggle in my job. In fact, there's something after doing it for 17 odd years that, that I struggle with personally is the, is I find it, um, you know, it's, it's, I feel pressure every day. I wake up feeling sometimes sick in my stomach and that's probably a bit of part of, part of the gig. So why do you do it? Well, yeah, I love it. And that's because of one of the largest leaks ever of corporate data to Australian media. 60 Minutes, The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald have obtained tens of thousands of Crown's internal files and documents from sources close to Crown's Melbourne headquarters. I, I've, I've always loved it from day dot. Uh, it, um, I've always wondered why other journalists, or more other journalists, don't love it. But then I think, geez, maybe I'm a real weirdo. Uh, but it gives me uh, great meaning, great purpose. I feel like it's important. I feel like I'm... I'm I'm helping the public and doing, you know, the most, a public service. And that, that, that lets you sleep really straight in bed at night. It's great fun. It's, it's such a great adventure. Uh, you know, I used to think, geez, I'm getting too old to run around to public phone boxes and call, you know, defence insiders or police detectives. And it's a pain in the ass. But it's, it's, you know, when you make the call and you get the meeting and suddenly you're getting this information, it's really, it's, you get, it's ex exhilarating. It's you get to peer into life in a way that is not only exciting and an adventure, but it's important. And you know, when you find things that the public deserve to know, it's a cliche, sure, but it's it's absolutely exhilarating. Yeah, the stress is not to be understated. Though for me, I mean, it's a big it's a big issue. And the the older I get, the more it it does weigh upon me. And and um, uh, you know, anxiety, panic attacks, fear. Uh, the fear of getting something wrong um, that hovers over you. You know, it's I've I've m made mistakes or worried about mistakes where I'll I'll be physically ill. You know, physically sick. I'll vomit in the morning. I'll I won't be able to concentrate, and that takes it out of you. Uh, you can sustain it in your twenties. I'm in my I'm approaching. I'm 40, forty. I'm almost forty. Do I want to keep doing that in my forties? I'm not sure. Something the public doesn't see uh, are the threats, the legal threats, the intimidation um, to try to keep the stories that you want to get into the paper, keep them out of the public's uh, gaze. Um, I mean, how challenging is that? Is that to you? Well, there's all sorts of threats you cop as an investigative journalist. Uh, yeah, the most insidious and depressing for me is the defamation now, lawsuits, because they tie you up, not just for months, but for years. And they put your work under a microscope. I welcome scrutiny, but a microscope uh, and a level of scrutiny that is simply exhausting uh, and you have to withstand it. And even if you're right, you may not be able to prove the truth of something to a court standard, even if it is indeed the truth. Uh, so that, that you know, the, the legal threats, are pretty exhausting. Uh, the physical threats, I think, the, the threats to yourself, they, they don't come often. I, I often say, you know, we don't operate in China or Russia, and thank God for that. We can do journalism in Australia. It's a great place to do journalism, but occasionally you do cop a, a threat. And um, uh, sometimes, for me, I think I've been able to absorb it, and then I look back and realise how unpleasant it was, and then and then. Uh, I'm probably less, some, it, the more I've been threatened, the more I've been warned, um, the less, you don't get better at, you almost get worse. It starts to build up, I think. So you almost get worse at, at dealing with it. You get more worried. I mean, I'm probably at a more heightened state of paranoia now, having done this for 17 years than I was 10 years ago, and certainly 17 years ago. Uh, you've written about international bribery, corruption, criminal links in business and unions, political donations and, and the local mafia figures. Um, you can talk a bit more about that, uh, that story, the, the mafia stories? I did lots of work on Italian organised crime or the Indrangheta, the Calabrian Mafia in Australia. Uh, it looked perhaps on the surface like a crime story and, and there was a lot of the crime story theatre uh, 
in it, but essentially it was a story about money in politics and, and the heart of my reporting on the mafia was about how the mafia, notorious Italian organised crime figures, were able to get close to certain very senior politicians and win some pretty incredible political outcomes. And of course, what seemed to be greasing the wheels were political donations. So it became a very, very great case study for me of the way that money buys access in Australian politics and the way money pollutes the democratic process. And what more sort of startling and stunning way to expose that than through you know, this very sinister, intriguing and terrifying strand of organised crime, collaborative organised crime, it still operates like it did in the, uh, in the 1800s and 1900s in, in today. There's uh, yet, you know, what's different? You've got the old Italians having meetings with no phones, uh, guys in their 60s and 70s and 80s planning massive drug importations, speaking the old dialect, yet also savvy enough to pass around the hat and get $150,000 for a, a major political party and deliver it in a way that there's no real or well, limited traceability. Um, uh, so you know, a great way into the, into the way money and power works in Australia. You, you recently did a story about uh, Crown Casino and links to um, criminal organisations. Um, part, part of that was obtaining internal documents. Um, just in a general sense, and I'm obviously not going to ask you about your sources, but how important are documents, uh, is the document trail, and, and how do um, journalists go about getting such documents? To, to get a document is, in some respects, everything in, in our game, because if a source says, or three sources say, it can still be discounted or dismissed. But if, it's, if you have an internal company document or police document, which relays a fact you know, in, in print, in the, on the company file, it, it suddenly has this veracity that the source briefings don't have. How do you get those sorts of documents? I mean, you, you quickly realise that it's all about getting the documents. So from, from day dot, the source comes forward with a great story and you say, well, terrific, but it ain't going to fly unless you can show me something from, from the company or from the agency. Do you have anything? And I'm amazed at how often people say, well, I did get that old laptop in the shed. And then you're, you know, your heart's beating, you're trying not to let on how excited you are. Oh, do you mind if I have a look at that? No, oh, sure, I'll, I'll dig up the, the, the hard drive. And, and uh, so, you know, you're always asking for it. Um, you're careful to, to do it in a way that protects them, that operates as best as, as you can, obviously, within the law. But knowing that if you're actually going to cut through, especially with something that's controversial, you know, having it on paper is everything. As we've discovered ourselves, Crown's internal data tells an extraordinary story. It reveals just who Crown was getting into bed with, as it lured China's wealthiest people to gamble in Australia. But things went terribly wrong. And to find out why, we're going to meet a Crown whistleblower who's taking a massive risk in speaking out. So many of the stories I've done, I've been proud of, but they've had no impact. They've just, they've come and gone without a trace. Uh, so, you know, th what we're trying to achieve really is political impact to make those in charge of our country or our agencies you know, care, but perhaps more to the point, feel enough public pressure to respond. Uh, and it's really, really hard. I mean, the politicians are past masters now at ignoring scandals because they know they'll just disappear from the front page, sometimes within, you know, within hours. So, if you can achieve that impact and have something lasting and, and a ch be it a legislative change or a, a change to a system of some sort, a lasting change that's going to ultimately make the community safer or protect a vulnerable group of people, that's why we're, that's why we're in this. But to achieve that, again, it's, it's really about coming up with strategies to have impact. And you've got to think not just like a journalist, but almost like a, a strategic communication specialist. How do I cut through? How do I become the story of the day? Does questioning the behaviour of high-profile, respected individuals and organisations add another layer of stress on you? Of course it does. It's so stressful to report on a war hero. It's extremely stressful to report on you know, senior respected economists at the senior executive level of the Reserve Bank. I mean, these are people with tremendous legal reputations with a huge amount of public support. 
yet you know we've got a job to do and so um you you put the fact the inevitable fact when I mean, you take on decorated war heroes you will cop a tremendous amount of of uh, artillery on social media and elsewhere and letters and phone calls and anger um you just you have to put a wall up to that it's part of the job it's no big deal and focus on one thing uh, is it true and is it in the public interest and if it's true in the public interest then i should report it whatever the public opprobrium that i might wear what's the truth too many people carry weapons others prefer suicide bombs as harsh as it sounds Life here usually has less value than in Australia, but not always. I'm meeting the family of a man you've probably never heard of, or ever would have, except for one sensational claim. That he was murdered after being detained and handcuffed by elite Australian soldiers. Assalamualaikum. Nice to meet you. Ali Jan's wife and children are getting used to fielding inquiries from curious Australians. So thank you for travelling so far. I know it's been a big journey for all of you. At one stage, a magistrate asked you or demanded of you that you reveal your sources. Um, what happened there? Well, we, so a magistrate, a judicial officer did ask uh, and basically threaten us through the powers of the court to come in to be called onto the stand and re reveal a source, a confidential source. We knew we weren't going to do that. Um, we, we pushed it and fought it. I remember the morning that we were due in court, the night before I was, had a pretty bad night's sleep and that was partly because my lawyer had sent me a message at about 11 o'clock at night saying, Dear Nick, you know, you'll be called up tomorrow, you're going to refuse to answer your sources in the stand. This is unlikely to happen. There's a chance you might be remanded immediately into custody. If that's the case, it's best that you don't wear any Nikes into court because the prisoners like Nikes, as in, oh. you know, wear a crappy pair of shoes and keep your head down in jail. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it made it a real life event. You realise the stakes are high. But that said, that's a pretty simple choice. You, you don't reveal your, your source. And in this case, we pushed back and we fought, we fought lawyers with lawyers. Uh, and in the end, uh, through sort of various appeals, we, we won the day and didn't have to take the stand. I didn't have to to have that choice to say on the stand, I'm going to break the law by not answering the question. But that said, I've been in coercive hearings where I've been in that situation and I've not said who my sources are and I've been warned you'll, you'll be charged and you say, well, you know, give me your best. And um, luckily in this country, they might drop, drop a brief of evidence to prosecute you, but... You know, wiser heads have prevailed in the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, the, the State DPP, and we've not we've not copped the charge for doing our job as of yet. Well, journalists are not above the law, and you know, I can imagine in an extreme example of a terrorist tells a journalist he's going to engage in a terror act. A journalist has an obligation to act responsibly there and inform the authorities about that, of course. Uh, but uh, I had a source who was in or around the mafia. And he was telling me really important things about serious political corruption. And I was put in a situation where I was told through a court process or threatened through a court process to reveal this person's identity. A contract was put out on this man's life by Italian organised crime. Ultimately, he was m murdered in the end. Uh, he's, he's, the stakes are sometimes high. Why do we protect this person's identity without that person knowing he's dead now, but without that person knowing he can tell me information that's in the public interest, and I won't reveal him, because if I do, he might be killed. If he doesn't have that confidence, he'll never tell me the information, and what's the product of that? The public will never find out something they're entitled to know. For many years, you've partnered with Richard Baker, um, and your joint bylines are a common um, scene and commonly seen in the, um, in the Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. How did that relationship develop and, and how did it work? So Richard and I began working together, I mean, almost from day dot. He was the person they sort of used to hire me from the ABC. And the moment I met him, he 
he gave me the real lowdown on the job, you know, who were the good bosses, who were the dickheads, uh, what, the, what the job would really be like. And I knew he was a, he was a truth talker. I actually knew he was somebody who would have my back. So we, our first major story was about a leading and very well-known and, and respected surgeon who was accused of serious, serious surgical malpractice. Uh, and it was a very difficult, highly politicised story taking on some pretty powerful forces and, and the medical establishment. And so we, we began to work on that together. And, you know, we, we fought a lot. We, we fought for the truth, though, about what was right and what, what was a fact and what was an allegation that couldn't stand up. And through that process, and it was a tough process, and sometimes, you know, we're, we, we're really uh, going at each other. Uh, the journalism is better and, the f and, you know, we are simply reporting their facts. We're getting colour, we're removing personality, we're, we're checking each other's biases. And we thought at the time, you know, and that was more than 10 years ago, geez, this is a good model and we, we held true to it ever since. And, and so from that, you know, develop a really deep relationship of trust uh, and, a, and a friendship. Um, uh, with a common goal, a common goal being you know, find the truth and tell it without fear or favour.